Welcome to the Author's Den, a place where we encourage reading and writing, a place where you can meet authors and book illustrators, a place to get your questions answered about writing, publishing, and promoting your book. Hello and welcome to the Author's Den. My guest today is Jennifer Odo, author of Madeline's Masquerade. Jennifer, thanks for being here. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, before we get into the book, tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I'm a writer and a publisher. I opened a, a publishing company of my own last year in January 2012, um, but I'm a writer first. Well, uh, tell me more about yourself before you were a writer. How, what did you do? Uh, I worked in business. I started in, in human resources, and I moved into business development. I did some accounting. Um, I did some project management and uh, a number of things that made me think I could open my own company. So, Why write a book? Um, I think it's, it's a good way to express yourself. Um, I always wanted to write a book. I wanted to write a book by the time I was 30. That was a bucket list goal of mine. How long did it take to write the book? When did you start? Okay. It took a long time. I started it in college. Um, it started as a short story in college, and then I thought maybe there was a little something there, so I started working on it. But, you know, college is busy, master's was busy, got married, sold a house, bought a house, and so I would put it down a lot and then pick it up again, and each time I did, I kind of had to start over a little bit, so. And you were working full-time at other jobs at the same time? Mm-hmm. Yep, so it took a long time for kind of a short book, but um, it was worth it in the end. How were you introduced to reading? Do you remember any books or favorite authors? Yeah, I had a lot of favorite authors. Um, I think I really got into reading when I was in middle school. You know, I read children's books when I was little, but I started reading Stephen King when I was maybe sixth or seventh grade. <coughs> loved Stephen King, loved John Saul, loved all of those books, and um, really got into mysteries and horror and that type of thing. So that's sort of the writing I like, but. Um, I also read, you know, Beverly Cleary and Ruth Chu and, and books like that, too. Did you have someone that encouraged you or inspired you to write? I had a fourth grade teacher who really inspired me to write because she never let me get away with anything. And I remember through, uh, I had her for fourth grade and sixth grade, and I remember all through fourth grade I was, I was writing and I always wanted to use the word toward, and I spelled it T-W-A-R-D and she would always circle it and say no such word. She wouldn't tell me that there really was a word and I was just spelling it wrong. She just kept circling it and saying no such word. And over time, by sixth grade, I had finally figured it out and did it right. And when she finally put that smiley face on my paper, it was such an accomplishment and I really just started to appreciate individual words. And I just really appreciated the process of writing and each individual word and it really meant something and that it was sort of disgraceful to spell a word wrong and I got really into the mechanics of, of writing too. Now, I can remember as a, as a young person having to do sentence outlines. And Did you have to go through that as yeah, well? Yeah, and I loved it. I loved diagramming sentences. I was such a nerd. I just loved that stuff. I hated math, but I loved the, the mechanics of writing. And how they fit together. And we can talk some more about adjectives in a little while. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What type of training did you have that better prepared you to be a writer? I'm just curious. I think just reading. I think reading is a great preparation. Um, a lot of times I hear from writers who say, well, I don't really have time to read anymore because I'm focusing on my own work. And I think that, that reading is just as important as writing, if not more so. Um, it helps you to figure out what your own style is, what you like, what you don't like. And, um, and then just writing every day. I, um, I've always written in journals. I've written in journals since I was in fourth grade. Um, and those are great things too because now I can look back and I can see when my first niece was born 15 years ago and how I felt on that day and I can share that journal with oh, her later. So um, I have stacks of journals and I love to, to keep track of my life and, and practice writing. Um, I have dream journals, I have day journals, um, and I think journaling is a great way to prepare for writing too. Let's talk a little bit about Madeline's Masquerade. You know, I, I, I pitched to you earlier that I'm about halfway through the book mm -hmm. and when I started out, I. Uh, Let's do it this way. I can tell it's a, a charming book, and I really like the characters in it, and I love the way it's written, but I'll be honest with you, when it started out, I didn't like Madeline. She was right. too haughty and condescending, and uh, I'm about in the point in the book where I can see things are changing, and I'm already feeling better about her, and why don't you tell us the plot of the book a little bit? Um, well, it's basically about a, a spoiled princess. She's not the typical princess, um, and eventually someone teaches her a lesson 
about how you should treat people in real life. So it's a little bit of a anti-bullying book, um, a medieval anti-bullying book. So it's a fairy tale based on medieval times, but um, it's it's really about her arc and, and how she changes and learns to be a better person. And someday she's going to be queen, and she needs to to learn how to be a good queen. So, well, can you tell us just just introduce a few more characters that she has to deal with, if you don't mind? Sure. Well, there's a servant, Serena, in the beginning. And so it's Serena's body that she's put into um, by a mysterious recluse. His name is Tarrant. So Tarrant puts her in Serena's body, this servant that she's been mistreating, that she's been unkind to. Um, there's a, a prince and a couple other characters, some, some queens and some nice uh, costumes and things like that that children might enjoy reading about the different clothing and, and period pieces, too, in there. Well, I know I'm going to be jumping on around because uh, there's a lot to you we've talked before, and there's a lot I'd like to cover. What's happening with the book right now? Is it a, it's, it's on sale? Is it, hey, are sales okay? What's going on? Yep, it's on sale, and then it's also um, being made into a short film right now. It's in post-production. Um, I got to write the, the screenplay for it, so that was really exciting to get to be on set every day and get to see actors actually act out lines that I'd written was just a, a trip. It was pretty, pretty cool. How did that come about? Well, the, the producer, director of that um, is somebody that I went to school with. And she went off to New York and, and got a bunch of experience under her belt. She came back here and uh, opened her own studio. And previously, we had made a, a commercial together for a fundraiser that I was doing. And so we knew that we worked well together. We went to the wrap party for that, and the director of photography was there, Eric Rubner. Um, and he was fantastic. Eric Rubner, actually, sorry. And um, he said, I heard you wrote a book, can I see your book? And I said, of course, every author has copies in her car. So I ran out to my car, brought some copies in. And about two weeks later, I got a call and they said, do you think you could write a screenplay for this? And I said, I would try. So that was a process that was exciting. And um, post-production was scary and fundraising and everything was difficult. But um, we got to production and that so, was great. So you, you, uh, you, had, you had someone offer to do a movie of your book. Right. But you said fundraising. Talk about that. What, did, what was that? Right. Well, it's a short, short film, and Detroit is, um, you know, a growing industry, but everybody still needs to do some fundraising. They did a Kickstarter. They raised $20,000 on Kickstarter to make effect. the film. And um, that was about half of what we actually needed. So um, things have been a little slow. Um, it should have been done maybe a, a year ago, but you know, we stop and start as we need to in the editing process on the back end of it to get it done. And they've done a little bit of fundraising here and there throughout to keep it going, but it's almost done. I saw the rough cut the other day. So that was exciting. The rough is done and they're working on the composite. So what is your hope for this? Um, I don't know. I just, I think I'm excited to see it. I would like to see it on the big screen. Um, hopefully it'll propel some book sales, of course. But I think it's just an exciting thing for any author to be able to see somebody saying their words. And I already got something out of it because I got to be on set. I got to talk to the actors. I got to talk about the book. And um, so I already got probably the most out of the process that anybody's gotten out of it so far. Getting off of the book for a moment, let's talk about the film. What, what was your actual involvement and how, how, what was unique about the way this was done? Um, it was kind of cool the way they did it. This was Eric Rubner's idea. Um, he wanted to do sort of a takeoff of the whole Japanese shadow box theater type thing. So to save money, instead of having these big sweeping sets with a castle and a magical forest and all that stuff, what he wanted to do was build tiny models and light those in a three-dimensional way and then film the actors in front of a green screen and then project them into the models. And it looks really cool. It's a very artistic take on it. Um, we're really excited about it for film festivals. When it's finished, I think it's just going to look amazing. So it really is more about the look of the actors, the look of the set, than the actual book. Um, for me, that was a good thing because I had to chop things down quite a bit, and that's hard to do to take a book and turn it into, you know, a 20-minute movie. So um, it's kind of good for me that it's focusing more on the the beautiful costumes and the sets and everything, and then I don't have to think about the dialogue and what I left cut. out and, mm -hmm. and things like that. So this is your first book? Mandolin's Masquerade was my first book. Have you written other things? I did. I wrote Awesome the Awesome Possum, 
Um, what is it? Awesome, the awesome possum. And the first installment is Awesome Gets is Awesome. And it's about adjectives. And I wrote that quite a while back, but I did include it in one of the earlier books that I published with the company. So it was published in, in 2012 by Pie Plate. Okay, well, the, the, you brought up publishing. Let's talk about that. So you've, you've written Madeline's Masquerade. How did you get it published? That was also a self-published book. Um, I actually had a, an offer, and I went through some negotiations, but a friend of mine had done the illustrations. I loved the illustrations. Um, they wanted to use their own in-house illustrator, and there was some pushback back and forth about doing that. Um, this and is I, for awesome. This was for Mandolin's Masquerade. Mm -hmm. It has just a couple of illustrations in it, but I didn't want to lose those and they wanted me to lose those as part of a contract. And so ultimately I decided that I would rather keep the book the way that I wanted it. Um, I had a background in sales, I had a background in marketing, which is what you need to do if you're a self-publisher, you need to be able to sell your book. And so um, I just decided to go that route. I have a question about the cover art for Madeline's. Talk about how you came about that. The cover art was something that I worked in coordination with the publisher. And so basically they gave me some choices of, of images that I wanted to use and things, and um, we just pieced that together. Um, the illustrator who worked on the interior il illustrations, he didn't do the, the cover illustration. Okay. Now, now you said that the illustrations were a point of contention again. Explain that to me. A little bit. Um, it just basically, most publishers have their own in-house illustration, and that's what they prefer to use. Um, some of that's because they have their own style and ways that they want to do things. Some of that's because they want to widen the audience, and so they may have an illustrator who already has a following. Mm -hmm. And I had used an unknown, somebody who'd never done illustrations before. He worked as a graphic designer, and again, he was a friend of mine. And so this was his first time doing illustrations. And it wasn't about his illustrations. His illustrations are great. They just wanted to use their own person to help with sales and who had a little bit of a name behind them. And in theory, that sounded great, but to me, it sounded like, um, you have a great band, we wanna sign your band, but we just want the lead singer and we don't want anybody that wrote any of the background music or did any of the awesome you know, stuff that led to that success. And so. that was important enough to you that you decided not to go with them. I did, yeah. So what did you do then? I, I found a self-publisher and um, just went through the process with them. I had already gone through the whole editing process and everything. I had hired an editor, which I think is important to do when you're self-publishing. Um, there's a lot of self-published books where, you know, the, the author just published it as is, and you need that second pair of eyes. Well, what was, the, what was the value of the editor? The value was that she really helped me to relook a couple sticky points in there that maybe needed to be developed a little bit more. Um, she found a lot of errors and things that you don't see when you've looked at a book so many times. And as I mentioned, it took me a long time to write it. So over that time, you know, there were some inconsistencies and things. And so she really flashed that out for me. So you've, you've had a mixed bag with going to the outside publishers. Talk about Pie Plate. What's Pie Plate? Pie Plate is, I'm trying to do something a little bit different with Pie Plate because I did go through the whole submissions process with other publishers. I did get form letters from those publishers. So you know what it's like. I know what it's like and I know that you don't get any valuable feedback to be able to at least know what's wrong with your work or what you can work on or um, even just if there's something wrong with your query letter and maybe you can be doing something a little bit better. Um, also, the traditional publisher typically gives a, a pretty small royalty and you kind of sign everything over to them and get a small royalty for the entire life of the book. And so what I'm trying to do is, is a couple things. I, I was scammed by an illustrator and I was scammed by an agent. Um, so I want to use some of my experience to, to make sure I'm providing a safe place for authors to submit their work. And then my background is also in education. And so I want to make sure that I'm educating those authors about why I'm really rejecting their work if I'm rejecting it or what needs to be worked on. We don't do form letters. Everything is a, a personalized response to the author. And then we're also doing something a little different with royalties. We're doing an escalator system. So basically, the more successful the book is, the higher their royalties become until eventually we're partners. That's good incentive. And so they're not making any more money on it than I'm making, and I'm not making any more than they're making. It doesn't start out that way, though. It doesn't start out that way, um, because I need to get my initial investment back. So we start at a, a lower royalty that's actually 
still double the standard in the industry because I'm a small publisher. I don't have the reach of a big publisher. So mm -hmm. I, I know that I need to um, give an incentive for an author to seek out a small press. Forgive me for, I'm a little confused about the process. Do you publish your own book? I published my one own book, but I publish other author work now. Oh, and I if see. I ever get around to writing another one, I'll probably publish that one too. Madeline, you publish as well? I did, I did, but I published that several years before Pie Plate. I published that in 2008. Is that in your staple now, or does that publisher still have rights to it? Or? That publisher still has rights to it, although as a self-published author, technically, I own all the rights to okay. that book. So, right. But it's still being sold by Dog Ear Publishing. But what we're going to do is when the short film comes out, we're going to re-release Mandolin's Masquerade under Pie Plate Publishing in a collector's edition, and that'll be sold with the DVDs. Gotcha. Well, talk to me about Pie Plate some more. Who, who have you signed, and what do you think you can offer them? Well, um, I've signed a couple really awesome authors. The first two books that I published were of an author named Shay Stone. Um, Pain, Pain, Go Away was her first book that she was offering by free download online. And I had read it several years before, and I thought it was a great, um, great book about chronic pain. She had spent time at the Mayo Clinic um, in pain management. She'd done some speaking there. She really knows about chronic pain. So that was the first book that I wanted to do. And then she wrote a relationship uh, book after that, Why Am I Still Single? So I published that one. And then the final book in 2012 was my first um, book with Pie Plate, The Awesome, The Awesome Possum. And then in 2013, we've published Chatty's Bad Dream. That's an author in Battle Creek named Alice Hart. And we also published Rusty the Robot's Holiday Adventures. And that's a, an author team, one of them living in Washington and one in Illinois. And then we also published the Pagan Children Learning Series, which is three books. And to date, those are our bestsellers. Um, they came out in August 2013. And that's a Pontiac uh, illustrator who did the illustrations on Awesome the Possum. And the author is uh, Don River. So. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. That's exciting. What, uh, uh, a couple of things come to mind. How did you, these people meet you, or how did you meet them? Well, I've done a lot of advertising. Um, I needed to build a strong website. I built a pretty strong blog, giving information about writing topics and things, trying to build some trust with authors. Um, at this point, we're getting about 1,000 submissions a week. So we have a lot to choose from. Um, so we can be you know, picky and choose things. Uh, personally, I can choose things that I like to do. Um, I have an associate editor now. I have an associate of acquisitions, and she's reading all of the queries and helping me to find good works. And um, we have a couple illustrators that we're contracting to work with, so starting to build a team as well to work with these authors. Do you have a day gig? No. <laughs> so you must be I pretty did. excited about doing this. I am pretty excited about it, yeah. I mean, just from what you said, it sounds like it's been very successful. You've been meeting a lot of people, and uh, you, have, you can pick and choose who you want to work with. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. I, I, I do somewhat have a day job because I'm still doing freelance writing. And so, um, but every bit that I make doing my freelance writing, I'm rolling into the business to make sure. So it is a, another side of the business doing that freelance writing. But um, yeah, it's exciting to be able to work with people and, and hear the excitement in their voice when I say, you know, we picked your book and we're going to publish this book. Yeah. And so that's kind of a cool thing for an author to be able to do that with another author. Let's say that. Uh Let's say that I was an author that you picked. What, what would that mean? What would you do for me? Well, there's a process. So the first thing is, um, before I even sign an author, I want to make sure that they're willing to surrender to the editing process, that, that they understand that there's going to be a lot of work involved. Um, we do a series of edits on the book. So once the contracts and everything are signed, we go through and, and we do kind of an overall edit. Um, and then we do a line by line edit. And then I have an associate editor who does the final copy edit. We work through that. If there are illustrations, we bring the illustrator in to work directly with the author. So we need to um, make sure that they have a good relationship and get through the whole illustration process. So you've signed me to Pipe Plate. What do I get? Do I get a book? Do you publish books? Do there are books on shelves? Or is there something I have to order online? What happens? Sure. Well, we're a traditional publisher, so we incur all the costs of publishing. So there's not really anything the author needs to do in terms of paying for anything or, or anything like that. Um, once we've actually signed the contract, we start off with, a, again, a, a lower 
royalty, which is going to escalate as we go forward. So you're saying that if when you sign somebody, they don't have to pay you? No. No, we're a traditional publisher, so we incur all the costs of the works that we publish, okay. so the author doesn't have to do anything. Um, even though I self-published my own works, I wanted to be able to give another author that feeling of somebody wants my work and they're willing to invest their so own nice. money in my work. That's so nice. It's an expense on your part. It is. It is. And my hope is with the escalating royalties that there's some incentive for the author to participate in selling their book. Um, that's important for, for any author, whether they're self-published or traditionally published. Their, their obligation doesn't end the moment that the book is published. They need to do readings, they need to do signings, they need to build a presence online, they need to brand themselves. You know, they have to participate in, in the selling of their book. Is each author guaranteed a certain amount of books? Or are they, they're, they're told that their books will be available at certain venues? How do you do that? Sure, well they get, they get some free copies of their own to get started. And then of course, just like any publisher, they get a discount on their books and they can purchase their books and use those for events. Um, as far as guarantees, we guarantee that we're gonna publish in print. We don't guarantee that we'll do ebook, although most likely we will. Um, but we wanna see how the print book does first. Some publishers are starting to back off of that. They're not saying they'll put it in print because everything's going towards ebook. But I like print, so. We're, we're making sure to do the books in print. Um, whether it's in hardcover or softcover, you know, really depends on the book itself. But um, we have those available on Amazon. We have them available on Barnes & Noble. We have them in some Barnes & Noble stores. We have them in local bookstores around here, and I'll get them into the bookstores in the areas where they live. Um, and then we're also, actually this week, we're moving into Kindle um, and Nook and iPad as well. Well, so. I wanted to ask you about that. What different ways can a an author get their book out? Well there's print obviously and then there's something really cool, I think it's really cool, called espresso. Um, espresso machine printing. And so basically I think of it kind of like a, a red box. Um, they're at different locations and you go and, <clears throat> excuse me, you pick the, the file that you're interested in and your book is printed right on site. So you can go around and shop or whatever. It's not bound the same way that a traditional book would be bound. Um, the cover, you know, is, is more just a sheet of paper, so it's not as fancy, but the price is less too. Mm -hmm. um, but what's cool about it is that those are all over the world. So when an author is first published, their book is immediately everywhere from, you know, Japan to Australia, um, everywhere here that they have print machines. And so anybody can go in and they can buy a copy of their book. And it also saves on paper. So, you know, we're saving some trees at the same time. You know, I'm kind of curious, uh, for, you know, I've done music all my life, and as for selling music, it was kind of important to have the point of purchase display and things like that. Do you concern yourself with things like that? Do you make uh, any promotions available to the bookstores that you have put these books in? Sure. Well, we're working a lot with a lot of the bookstores. We're trying to do exciting events and things like that um, to help them to sell their books. It's really important for small bookstores, especially those independent bookstores, to have the support of the publisher and the support of the author to be able to sell their books. So um, we definitely do you know, displays, we do interactive events, and we're doing everything we can to really work with the community to sell them too. That's great. So you, you mentioned a couple of different books and people that you're working with that you're publishing, but you mentioned something about the Pagan series. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. That sounds interesting. It's exciting. So the author came to me and the illustrator, and the illustrator is one that I had worked with before, so I already had a trust level with her, um, T.S. Lamb. She's amazing. She's easy to work with. She rescued me with Awesome the Awesome Possum because originally that was the um, there was an illustrator who had scammed me on that and taken money from me and didn't do the illustrations. Mm. So she really helped me out with that book, so I love her. So she came to me and said, this is a series I want to do. I'm pagan. I have a friend who's pagan. We were talking about the fact that there are no pagan books for very young children, like preschool age children. But, are you comfortable explaining what that means, pagan means? Sure, well, I'm not pagan, so it's hard for me to explain someone else's religion. But it's a religion. It is a religion. It's a very old religion. Um, it's based a lot in environment. It's based a lot in nature and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's actually very beautiful. Um, everyone I've met in the community and selling these books has been amazing. Just really, really nice people um, who are very excited about the books. And what are so. some of the titles? We have Who is a Witch? And that explains in an everyday life situation who may be a witch to a small child. Um, we're hearing that it's really exciting for a child to be able to look through that and see that 
oh, you know, a, a male person can be a witch. And, and to get rid of that stereotype that a witch has a green face and is a scary um, type person and, and really learn a little bit more about their parents if their parents are witches. And what are some of the ti titles of the books? Um, we have Who is a Witch? We have um, What is Magic? And What are the Elements? And each one of those books talks about those pagan topics specifically. And I know that you said you have a second book. Let's talk about that. Okay. Awesome the Awesome Possum. Awesome Gets is Awesome. And um, that, funny enough, that book's a little bit of an anti-bullying book as well um, because it's about the power of adjectives and it's about calling others names as well and, and assigning adjectives to certain people. Um, but it's about a possum and his friends at the zoo. And Awesome the Possum learns from Keeper Jim what adjectives are and he learns that he's awesome. So he decides to go around to the other animals at the zoo with his friends and give them adjectives of their own so they know what kinds of animals that they are too. And uh, a little bit of trouble ensues when the adjectives kind of go awry, but they learn a lesson in the end. Great, great. You know, I'm kind of curious, you know, you've written, you've written these two books. When you look back at them, what would you do differently? I would do a lot differently with Mandolin's Masquerade. I think I learned a lot in writing the screenplay. I learned about being more concise. I learned about um, maybe telling more through the dialogue than through the descriptions. I learned to cut back on adjectives a little bit. Um, I learned to be a little less wordy. And also, I changed the ending in the movie. And I think I probably would change the ending in the book as well. Ah, will that be in the revised? I think so. I think I'm going to have an alternate ending in the revised Oh, there version. you go. It seems to me that there's a bullying theme in both your books. Is this a personal reflection at all? Or? A little bit. I, I think a lot of us were bullied when we were younger. And uh, that's a little bit of a sensitive thing for, for me that I felt like I was bullied in elementary school. I was the new girl. I moved to my elementary school in fourth grade. And so, um, you know, I had to start over and, and learn what it was like to not be popular and not be one of the kids that grew up with everybody else. And um, yeah, I think that kind of flows through some of my writing. If someone wanted to find out more about you or the books, what can they do? Well, we have a website. Um, and we also have a pretty strong Facebook presence, but our website is www.pieplatepublishing.com. And we have our catalog right on the front page. You can get to the, the blog on that page. And also we have author pages for every one of our authors. So once again, when someone goes to the website, they can see the, the offerings that you have. Do they get to see more about the authors themselves? We have individual author pages for each author. And um, each one of those, anything they do, any events they have coming up, if they do any videos and things like that. Um, Shay Stone, she's great at doing videos. She's got videos about chronic pain and things that she learned um, in dealing with her chronic pain. She has some really funny relationship videos with relationship advice where people email in and they tell her what topics they want her to cover and she covers those. And that's available on the website. Yeah, so we have some really great videos and hopefully some good content for anybody that visits. What, what else are you doing that you're looking forward to as far as promotion? We work really hard on our Facebook page and we're doing a lot of giveaways and things like that. We do caption contests. We do, um, I'll randomly say, somebody tell me a story. I feel like hearing a story. Um, we do Manuscript Mondays where writers um, can give us a little bit of a hint of what they're working on, where they can give us a small excerpt of what they're doing. And so um, just trying to get a lot of participation with, with authors so that readers who come on can see the process and see how authors are starting off and, and workshopping their works and talking about their works on Facebook. And so it's great for readers to see that, but it's also obviously really beneficial for the authors to do that too. Any other social media networking that you're doing? I kind of like to think of myself as a social media guru. So I'm on Twitter and I'm on LinkedIn and we're on Pinterest and everything that's out there I try and be on. Um, the problem with that is you sometimes spread yourself a little thin, so some of my sites aren't updated as often as our Facebook site is up, updated every day, and our website is not static, that's updated every day. But um, I try and spread myself on all of those and ask questions on Reddit and do as much as I can to stay involved. On Twitter, we're Pie Plate Pub, at Pie Plate Pub, and actually most of our, our sites we use Pie Plate Pub as our handle. Jennifer, real quickly, any advice you'd have for someone who's writing a book or wants to be an author? Sure, my advice is to write every single day and don't give up on those queries because there's a, a publisher out there that wants them. Maybe Pie Plate. Maybe Pie Plate. Well, thanks so much for being here today and being on The Author's Den. It's a pleasure to meet you. I wish you a lot of success. Thank you. We really, really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you, you too.